Greetings on this seventh Sunday of Easter. For today's worship, I am joined by liturgical ministers from St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Williamsburg, Virginia. They are Kathy Boyd, Ginger Ambler, Deirdre Broche, Bruce Ebersoll, Rob Bell, and I'm Lisa Green. Our music is led by Phaedra McNaughton and the St. Martin's Choir. If you haven't already, I invite you to take a moment to create your worship space before we begin. You might want to light a candle or have some flowers in view, either outside or in a vase. It is still Easter. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the apostles came together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read from Psalm 68, responsibly, by whole verse. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. Let them vanish like smoke when the wind drives it away. As the wax melts at the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteousness be glad and rejoice before God. Let them also be merry and joyful. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. 
exalt him who rides upon the heavens. Yahweh is his name. Rejoice before him. Father of orphans, defender of widows, God in his holy habitation. God gives the solitary a home and brings forth prisoners into freedom, but the rebels shall live in dry places. O oh God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook and the skies poured down rain. At the presence of God, the God of Sinai, at the presence of God, the God of Israel, you sent a gracious rain, O oh God, upon your inheritance. You refreshed the land when it was weary. Your people found their home in it. In your goodness, O oh God, you have made provision for the poor. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. He rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. He sends forth his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God. His majesty is over Israel. His strength is in the skies. How wonderful is God in holy places. The God of Israel, giving strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. 
They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you for the words that you gave to me, I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we've mentioned before, Easter is not just a day, but a season that lasts 50 days. Over the past several weeks, we have lived Jesus' story with all its highs and lows. We've experienced the triumph and the joy of Palm Sunday, and we traveled through the agony of Jesus' suffering and death in Holy Week. We have felt the grief and the heartache of the disciples. We went to Jesus' tomb on the first day of the week with Mary Magdalene, the third day after Jesus' death, only to find the tomb empty. And in the weeks since the resurrection, we've been with the resurrected Jesus, walked and talked and dined with him and touched the holes in his hands and sides. So the shock and wonder of Jesus' triumph over death has had several weeks to sink in and become the new normal. In biblical studies, there are clues that the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles are actually a single work written by someone that we call Luke, and they make up an extended story with Jesus at the center. The Gospel of Luke, as are all the Gospels, is a kind of heroic narrative of the life and ministry of Jesus narrative form. The book of Acts, on the other hand, is the next step. It's the story of the post-resurrection followers. It's the story of what happens and the beginnings of the early church. Which brings us to today. Here's the scene in our reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The resurrected Jesus and his friends are in Jerusalem. They've gotten used to being back together again. The disciples have gotten used to having him back. Maybe this whole unpleasant business with the cross and the Romans and the violent death, maybe that's just an upsetting memory and we've moved on. Jesus' friends clearly are still thinking that they're just back on track because they ask him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Now that you're back, Messiah, is it time to finish what you started and drive out the Roman occupation and make, make you the king? For whatever reason, maybe they haven't been paying attention, which is entirely possible. Or maybe Jesus hasn't clued them in. We don't know. But Jesus' friends are still thinking with the old pre-resurrection limited mindset. Their vision is limited and they're waiting for everything to go back to normal. I wonder if that sounds familiar. Notice a couple of things. Remember that Luke and Acts are one continuous story. We have a little hint that something is changing, that there is an important shift happening of some kind, because Luke is no longer calling Jesus' followers disciples, but calling them apostles. This matters. We tend to think of these words as interchangeable, but actually there's a significant difference. There's, and this is a transition. More about that in a minute. The other thing to notice is that as always, Jesus answers a short-sighted question with this expansive, instructive answer. He brushes aside what they think they're asking 
he says, there's stuff you're not supposed to know yet. Let God, God handle that stuff. So, never mind. But here's what you do need to know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, and you will be my witnesses, not just here, but throughout the world. So just as this is sinking in, as they watch, Jesus is lifted up, ascended, taken out of their sight. And so not only is Jesus not about to take over like they wish he would, become some kind of military king, restore Israel, drive out the Romans, he's gone again, gone, lifted up, out of their sight. I would imagine that they're sorry they asked. So I wanna pause right here for a moment in this moment. This is one of those rare, perfect moments in our life of faith, where if we're paying attention, we realize that everything lines up. All the stories line up, the biblical story that we're working our way through, the liturgical cycle of the year, and our own lived experience. These things line up in this perfect moment. Do you remember those clear, you remember with the old encyclopedias, those clear cellophane overlays? You could look at the diagram of a human body and then you could lay down different clear see-through pages. Here's what the organs look like. This sheet shows the skeleton. But then if you put all the pages down at once, you get the whole picture. Things line up to show how things fit together. This moment is one of those moments liturgically, biblically, and personally. Last Thursday, the liturgical calendar observed Jesus' ascension, and we are in an in-between waiting for Pentecost. In fact, our lesson today from Acts is almost the same, it dovetails a little bit with, this, with the lesson from, from ascension. In the biblical story, Jesus is taken up again. We get the story of the ascension and that question of now what? And right now in our real time, so-called real time, in our real lives, we find ourselves in the same place. Something has ended. Something new is coming, happening. Now what? Well, now we wait. We wait. But we do have some clues from the story to help our waiting. Jesus' parting words hold some reassurance. We will receive the power that we need, and we will have a job to do. Also, there's this nudge from the two mysterious dudes who just show up. Hey, what are you doing standing around? And this takes me back to the difference between disciples and apostles. They may not yet know what it means or what to do. They may not be truly equipped yet. But Jesus' followers are no longer mere observers and students. They are becoming witnesses, spreaders of the gospel, messengers. And that's the difference between the two words. Apostles are messengers. They're witnesses. They are active bearers of Christ out into the world. And this, my friends, is the whole point. It's the whole point. With the departure of the physical, even risen Jesus, Jesus' physical risen body, those who were mere followers become the presence of the risen Christ in the world. We become the risen Christ in the world. They become the body of Christ. We become the body of Christ. So today, on the seventh Sunday of Easter, we are at a turning point, a time of waiting. With the apostles, we are in this in-between. It's like, it's what we like to call a liminal space. Liminal means belonging to two different places or states of being, a threshold. Something has ended, something else has not yet quite begun. But because Jesus has life, we have life. And no matter how relentlessly the world presses in on us and tries to pull us off course or frighten us with the threat of death, even if Jesus physically departs from this earth, the Holy Spirit 
keeps alive God's purposes and fills us with God's life-giving power. And so we wait. It grates on us, the waiting. We may feel afraid. We may feel crushed by grief. We don't know what's coming. Normally, in the old normal, we're gonna to have to think of a new word for normal. In the old normal, life was so fast and designed to eliminate waiting. You can sign in ahead of time so that when you get there, they can just move you right in, or you can make your Starbucks order ahead of time and just drive through and pick it up. No waiting, no lines, no waiting. Normal life is so fast and designed to eliminate waiting that it's upsetting and it's unnerving for us to, to have this new rhythm. But wait, we must. Wait, we must. Wait, sit, be. And perhaps hardest of all, we mustn't assume that we already know what's coming. We mustn't assume that. We mustn't assume that we already know what we're waiting for. One of the last things the apostles say to Jesus in person, maybe the last thing they say to Jesus in person is, we already know what you're gonna do, what you're gonna do. when are you gonna do it? This is the last thing they say to him. And he goes, shh, wait. Jesus is gone, but the Holy Spirit is coming. Next Sunday is Pentecost, the birthday of the church. The day when we receive God's gift of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. But in real time, we're still uncertain. We don't know what is coming, so we wait. And we cling to the promise that God always, always provides what we need. Let us pray. Oh God, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us. Amen. Let us say the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Alleluia. What was dead shall live. What was dark shall shine. What was forgotten shall be remembered. For the Lord is risen and walks among us. Let us bring before God the needs of all our world, claiming that renewal and proclaiming Christ is risen indeed. God of life, in gratitude and great joy, we praise you for the gifts of Christ's resurrection. Give us hope, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. In this Easter season, which brings joy to all Christians, inspire us to work toward the unity of the church, that Christ's body may be one, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. For all who at this challenging time have particular need of the gift of Easter, for all who journey from illness to health, from despair to hope, from grief to consolation, from loneliness to love. We pray for those who, in our community and across the world, are most affected by the coronavirus, those who are ill and homebound, those who have no homes, healthcare workers, those stocking grocery shelves and delivering food, those who have lost their jobs. We pray for the needs and concerns of this congregation, especially for Anna Wolf, Rob Lima and family, Jim Axtell, Vanessa Hudson, Aidan Knudsen, Don and Robin Cedarling, Bruce Hurden, and Carol and Vip Vapovitz. We pray for those deployed and serving in our military, Josh Eppert, Sam, Mason, and all who serve. We pray for all our neighbors that death may have no more power over us, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We pray for all who suffer and all who mourn, that today we may wipe away all tears, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Grant us the persistent faith of Mary Magdalene and the surprised belief of, John, of Peter and John. May we long to be a sign of life in our world. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. God of life, we thank you for the mystery planted in us, the paradox of life from death and community from scattered disciples. We praise you for the dying which saves us from death and for the rising which brings us life. We pray as we live through Jesus, the risen one, in the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, <clears throat> as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A few announcements before we conclude. First of all, thank you, Kathy, for that wonderful sermon such an important uh, time of waiting for us, as you say, uh, liturgically 
biblically and personally. Very grateful for that. After the blessing, uh, we'll offer the sign of peace. If you're worshiping with someone today, I invite you to uh, extend the peace to them, or if not, to call someone on the phone or send an email. Um, we're all part of the communion of saints, and that's an important way for us to stay connected. Next week, as Kathy mentioned, is Pentecost, and our worship will be led by our four graduating high school seniors, Mac Ambler, Campbell Burden, Josh Cosby, and Vicki Harder. If you have a word of wisdom or blessing that you'd like to share with them, please email me. Our Wednesday webinars, Bread for the Journey, will continue this Wednesday, and you'll get some information about that on Monday. And finally, uh, as we heard in the reading, the disciples uh, after Ascension, now apostles, were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. And this time between Ascension Day and Pentecost is often a special time of prayer. However you like to pray, I encourage you to do that. Sunday night at 6 p.m., our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, will preach at an ecumenical memorial service for lives lost to COVID-19 that's presented by the National Council of Churches and we'll put a link uh, to register for that in our worship email as well. And in the spirit of prayer, since it is Memorial Day weekend, a different one than we've experienced, but uh, maybe an opportunity to focus on the meaning behind that holiday, uh, let's pray uh, this Memorial Day prayer together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh, judge of the nations, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our country who gave their lives for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the risen Christ who has passed into the heavens clothe you with power from on high and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ is always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Alleluia, alleluia, let us go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.